Sorry, I'm getting old. Uh, I've been here uh, 10 years. When I started, um, my oldest girl was uh, a year old. And I forget. Anyway, I've been here 10 years. And uh, my oldest is now 11. So kind of, I used to think of myself as the young guy in the group. I mean, I guess I'm going to be one of the older guys. So, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about knee arthritis. It's a very simple talk, you guys. This, some of you guys are very well informed patients, and that's great. And uh, this might be a little repetitive for you guys, but hopefully you'll learn a few things tonight. The knee joint uh, is the largest hinge joint in the body, and it's referred to as a hinge joint because it, it mainly works in flexion and extension, and it's. It's not a simple hinge joint, though. It actually moves in several planes. And it consists of uh, three major bones, the thigh bone or femur, mm -hmm. the shin bone or tibia, and the kneecap or patella. And although we like to think of it as a simple hinge joint that bends back and forth, as you move your knee, it's actually very complex. The shin bone also rotates, and it, it translates back and forth on the thigh bone. So it's a little more complex than a simple hinge joint. Um, what we're going to focus on is this surface on the end of the thigh bone and the surface on the top of the shin bone. That's the articular cartilage. Um, and as you'll see, as that wears away, that, that basically uh, is the arthritic process. Next slide. So it's estimated that 70 million Americans uh, have some form of arthritis. The most common form of arthritis is osteoarthritis, uh, which is the typical wear and tear type arthritis or degenerative arthritis that occurs with age. Uh, there is a somewhat of a genetic component to it, um, but what you need to know is that it's, it's a degenerative process and it gets worse over time. It doesn't get better. The other form of arthritis is that of rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone in here has type or diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, but that's a more crippling genetic form of arthritis. It's an autoimmune disease that typically affects almost all the joints in your body. Uh, that, that is a more severe form. Next slide. So when we talk about uh, arthritis, what we're referring to is, again, that cartilage cap on the, end, on the end of the bone. If you think of a chicken bone, that gristle that sits on the end of the bone, arthritis essentially is when that cartilage surface begins to wear away and it leads to what we call a bone-on-bone -bone deformity or bone-on-bone -bone contact, which really is where your pain comes from. Next slide. This is a patient that I actually just operated on uh, last week, 42 years old, uh, believe it or not, a construction worker, hadn't worked in like three years. This is an x-ray of his right knee and his left knee. And the cartilage cap in his right knee, we know it's present. He doesn't have any arthritis in this knee because we can see that he has a nice space between the bones. We can't see cartilage on an x-ray, but we know he has it in his right knee because of this space. If you look at his left knee, just bone on bone. Pretty impressive for a 42-year-old guy. And basically what happened over time is that um, the cartilage wore, continued to work in construction, and it got to the point where he could barely walk. Now his tibia, or shin bone, is starting to swing over this way, and you see he's, he's very bull-legged uh, when he walks. We fixed that last week. When you come in the office, we always like to kind of get it general idea of how much pain you're having. Um, they like to know, you know, is it every day? Um, does it interfere with your sleep? Just how far you can walk? Um, basically, what's important to me is, is it affecting your activities of daily living? And how much is it affecting your quality of life? Uh, next, next slide. Some people will use a pain scale. But this really isn't that important to me. Um, I think pain is very subjective. It's hard to put a number on it. But, but really, when you see me, what I want to know is how much is this affecting your day-to-day -day life? Next slide. This is an important slide, though, because it's not just pain, though. It's also mobility. If it's getting the point, you know, where is it? Is it the point where you can barely walk down the block, or is it, is it just at the point where it's starting to affect your golf swing? So, you know, the treatment is also based on mobility. In terms of treatment, obviously, we do everything we can to keep you out of the operating room. Um, there are patients in this room, I'm sure, that have seen me that we've 
managed to stay out of the OR for years and years. We start very simple, oral, oral medication, uh, whether it's an analgesic such as Tylenol, or an anti-inflammatory such as Motrin, uh, or corticosteroid or pre oral prednisone. Uh, those are the most simple forms of treatment, but they do have you know, their side effects that you have to be careful with. The next line of defense is a injection, whether it's cortisone, whether it's a, a joint lubricant injection. Uh, some of you may have already had a series of visco supplementation. Um, it's a series of five injections, and it's aimed at increasing the viscosity of your joint fluid. And it does work. Uh, I actually get them in my knee. Uh, some docs will send you to water therapy. Some docs will send you to physical therapy. It really kind of depends on, on where your pain is and where your arthritis is. Next, next slide. When all of those things uh, have failed, the steroid injections, the hyaldin injections, or, or, or the oral anti-inflammatories, and it's gotten to the point where it really is affecting your quality of life. You're just not happy. That's when we start to think about a knee replacement. Now, I think the term knee replacement is kind of a misnomer. It's, it's not truly a replacement. A hip, when we replace a hip, we literally cut the ball off, put a new ball in. A knee replacement really is more of a resurfacing. Okay, We're just making very fine cuts eight millimeter cuts on the end of the bone and we're putting a metal cap on each end. Uh, we're basically putting a new hinge in there. Uh, more than 500,000, it's probably, most, probably more like 700,000 knee replacements uh, performed each year in the U.S. And most of the studies show a 90 to 95% patient satisfaction rate. So this is a picture of a knee replacement. Um, we're going to go over this in a little more detail, but it consists of a femoral component that fits on the end of the thigh bone, the tibial component, that fits on the end of the shin bone, and this piece of plastic that sits between them. Okay, and this plastic, or polyethylene, uh, is the weak link. Uh, most knee replacements that we're putting in now, probably 90% will go 15 to 20 years, uh, but they don't last forever, and the reason is this uh, polyethylene. Again, this is an implanted knee. You can see we're not replacing the whole femur. We're just putting a metal cap on the femoral component, a metal cap on the tibial side, and this polyethylene that sits between. Uh, you can't see it here, but the patella is often resurfaced as well. We don't replace the whole patella, we just make, take about 10 millimeters off and we place a plastic button under it. Uh, this is that same gentleman from last week. Uh, again, this was his right healthy knee, this is his new left knee, okay? Again, it's not a full replacement, it's more of a resurfacing. This is his femoral component, it's just a cap. You can see we took very little off of the thigh bone just from here to here, okay? This is his tibial component, and you can't see it, but the plastic sits uh, between them. So we're basically putting in a new hinge. Uh, next slide. There's all kind of knee replacements out there, okay? Most surgeons kind of stick with one prosthesis that they feel most comfortable with. There's some guys that do use more than one, um, but what you need to know is it's really what your, comfortable, what your surgeon feels most comfortable with and what he's had the best success with. Um, you see the Zimmer uh, band outside, excellent prosthesis, I've used it in the past. Um, I use uh, most of the time Depew uh, Sigma Knee. Uh, I like it because there is a female option. I like it because uh, it can be put in a minimally invasive uh, technique. It comes in a wide variety of sizes. Next slide. There's basically two types of knee replacements. There's what we call a, a fixed bearing replacement, which is probably the most widely used in the country today. Uh, and when we refer to fixed bearing, we mean this plastic piece, the polyethylene that we talked about, that sits in one position, that does not rotate. Okay, as opposed, uh, next slide. Uh, again, a thigh component, tibial component, and this fixed piece of plastic, as opposed to, next slide, the rotating platform. Uh, this is a knee that I started using maybe seven, eight years ago for my younger patients. As we talked that very first slide with the anatomy, the knee is not a simple hinge joint, okay? It does, the tibia actually, uh, your shin bone does translate and it does rotate. And this prosthesis, this is not a fixed component. This plastic actually rotates as you bend your knee this plastic rotates, and, and, the, and studies show that that will cut down on the wear rate of that polyethylene. So this is really aimed at young patients that are really going to push push the limits. Uh, but I like it because I think it will last longer. Next slide. People always ask me, when, when should I get it done? Should I wait? You know, and that's really only a question you can answer. Um, 
I tell people you'll know when you're ready. When you've tried every other option and it's at the point where you can't work or you can't play with your grandkids or whatever it is you want to do. You can't go fishing, you can't play golf, and you're tired of the pain, that's when you get it done. I don't think there is, there is no such thing as waiting too long uh, because most deformities we can fix. But the thing you need to remember is osteoarthritis is degenerative. It's not going to get better. It's only going to get worse. In terms of outcomes, again, 90-95% patient satisfaction rate. Uh, certainly, it's variable uh, with with your weight and your age. Uh, this guy in the office here tonight, I won't point him out, but he's a young guy who did his knee replacement, and he was cycling 25 miles a day about what, five weeks out my that's, that's a little exceptional, but uh, it's more tribute to what a great uh, athlete he is. Uh, next slide. One other thing I'd like to talk about briefly is a, what's called a partial knee replacement or a unicompartmental. Um, some patients, they come in, they have arthritis that's located only in one portion of the knee. So we are able to go in and just do a smaller incision, more minimally invasive technique where we only resurface that one portion of the knee. Next slide. These are actually two patients of mine. Uh, this is a full knee replacement, okay, where you know everything was diseased, we had to replace the whole thing. All right, this is what we call a unit compartment or partial knee replacement, where we just go in and replace this inner side here. Okay. That's okay. Advantages, you know, so this patient again has just unit compartmental disease. There's no arthritis on the lateral compartment or in the in the femoral trochlear region here. So we're able to go in through a small incision uh, and we're able to maintain the ligaments and just resurface that inner side there. And these patients typically stay just for a day in the hospital. They rehab a lot quicker, have a lot less pain. Next slide. Again, potential advantage of partial knee. Um, you're basically not sacrificing any ligaments. There's no, less bone you're taking. It's a smaller surgery. It's just patients feel like that knee is like their virgin knee. It doesn't feel mechanical like a knee replacement sometimes does. Next slide. Again, in summary, uh, as you know, leading cause of knee pain in this country is arthritis. Most arthritis is degenerative. It's not going to get better. Um, patient satisfaction rate usually is around 90-95% for a knee replacement. Thank you. So this is going to be short to the point. We already went over the difference between osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis, so we're not going to spend a lot of time on that. Um, we know what a healthy knee looks like. That's what everybody starts out with. This is what everybody ends up with if we all live long enough. So that's our goal. All right. Keep going. Um, and it's progression. And. Everybody has different symptom complexes. Some people have knees like this that have minimal symptoms, and some people have knees like this that have horrendous symptoms requiring knee replacements. It's individual. There's a lot of different contributing factors, a lot of which have to do with your pain threshold. Uh, and genetics has a lot to play with it as well. We won't get into that right now. Um, as we said before, uh, they've done satisfaction studies and they found that knee replacements are one of the most satisfying procedures that anybody has. I can tell you that the rehabilitation is also one of the toughest with respect to orthopedics. There's two tough rehabilitations and one is rotator cuffs and one is total knees. But if you make it through that, you know, eight, six, eight, ten, twelve week time course, then you've got a good functioning knee for the rest of your life. All right. Uh, when do you consider surgery? Basically, as Dr. Lucchetti said, once your symptomatic treatment is no longer successful, then you move on to replacing the knee. And biomechanically, um, it doesn't make it a normal knee. The goal is to make it a pain-free knee to allow you to do relatively low-demand activities, walking, biking, swimming, golf, doubles, tennis. Uh, I can tell you up front, there's no good knee for a young, active, healthy person. Meaning, there's no knee that's going to allow you to go back out 
and run marathons, there's no knee that's going to allow you to go back out and play volleyball or high impact activities. But, so the expectations have to be there when you start, but walking, biking, swimming, bowling, golfing, doubles tennis, very realistic. All right. We talked about how you treat the symptoms, and now we'll talk a little bit about how you fix it. Next slide. All right. So the replacement is really a misnomer. It's not really a replacement, it's a resurfacing. What you're trying to do is reconstitute a surface with a cap that sits on the femur, a tray that sits on the tibia, and a plastic spacer so that when this knee moves, you don't have bone rubbing on bone, you've got metal moving on plastic. And there's a lot of different models. And I tell everybody it's a little bit like Ford, Chevy, Toyota. Everybody feels very strongly about what they drive. Everybody feels very strongly about what type of knee model they use. And I do think there's advantages and disadvantages to each. Uh, and it tends to be surgeon specific. Next slide. One of the things that Zimmer came up with, and you can look at some of the concepts out in the van, are that they were the first to do cadaveric studies, and they realized that there were differences between males and females. And one of the biggest differences is that females have a wider pelvis. Why do they have a wider pelvis? Because, thank God, they're the ones that have to give birth. Um, but what that does, that puts different stresses on the knee. So the wider the hips are, the larger the angle between the hip and the knee and the knee and the ankle. And that's what's called your mechanical axis or your weight-bearing axis. And because of that, the kneecap tracks a little bit differently. So in the past, where everybody was using the traditional implant, which expected the kneecap to track centrally, it created the gender-specific knee implant. Next slide, please. They realized by doing a lot of cadaveric studies that the shape was different as well. That the anterior-posterior tended to be the same, but for the same anterior-posterior size, the medial lateral size was different. And so they created a series of implants that had that difference, and they call them gender-specific implants. Next slide. And so with that, what they've done is uh, enlarged the posterior condylar section, narrowed the anterior section, and decreased the depth of the trochlea. So the kneecap can sit a little bit deeper and decrease the, thus decrease the compressive forces. So what happens is that they deepen this so the kneecap, as it moves back and forth when you bend the knee, has less compression. All right? Therefore, if somebody still has good articular cartilage underneath the kneecap, with the gender specific, oftentimes you don't have to replace it. It also allows you to use the proper anterior posterior size without having medial and lateral overlap, which was a problem in a lot of the women that we had done total knees on before. So, you know, aside from all the numbers, the gender specific knee was just that. They did that after all the cadaveric studies. They fashioned it and created those changes. And in my instance, that's what I use for all the women. Now, in several instances, that fits better for some of the men. But we definitely make sure that we don't tell the men that they have the women's knee, because that would absolutely be devastating. Um, so, as they say, sometimes even in the women, we use the regular knee because it fits better but it at least gives you more options, more sizes. And that's really, there's no magic to it. It was just done from uh, multiple studies and with those several changes. All right. tonight uh, briefly about osteoarthritis in the hip, hip replacement, and a little more specialized type of hip replacement, which is called a hip resurfacing arthroplasty. We've gone through this stuff uh, several times already. We're going to talk about osteoarthritis, where the main symptom is pain, at, with motion and rest, stiff joints, swollen joints, loss of range of motion in the joint. 
and these symptoms will, may interfere with your normal activities. What causes it? Excessive wear, joint injuries from previous sports activities, age, obesity, deformity of the bones within the joint, and work-related activities or accidents. This is a basic hip anatomy. There is a cartilage cup, a cartilage ball, this is your pelvis, and this is your femur bone going down to your knee. Next. When we look at a normal hip, we see the ball, we see the beautiful space around it, and when we look at an arthritic hip, we see there is no space left. What can you do for uh, arthritis of the hip in a non-surgical way? Lifestyle modification. The Boy Scout Creed. The thrifty, brave diet, do everything right. It's difficult to do, and it's hard to do these things. We talk about weight control. Exercise and physical therapy can be helpful. Anti-inflammatory medication, steroid injections of the hip, and joint fluid therapy. Exercise is one of the best treatments for osteoarthritis, although it's hard to do. It increases pain, improves flexibility, and helps maintain your weight. A diet can facilitate weight loss, which results in reduced stress on your hip joint. Hot and cold packs are helpful. Warm baths are helpful. You can take Tylenol, non-steroidal medications like Advil and uh, Aleve, creams and sprays. Narcotic painkillers are not particularly great idea as they're addictive. Corticosteroids by mouth and also injections of hyaluronic acid. All these medicines do have side effects. So when we've tried all these uh, simple things and nothing works, uh, the standard at this time for an arthritic hip is a total hip replacement. So you remember the normal architecture of the hip, the ball and the neck of the femur have been removed. A metal shell is placed in the cup part of the hip with a plastic liner, a ball of some bearing surface, and a stem that goes down the inside of the thigh bone. Next. So the damaged parts of your joint are replaced with metal and plastic implants. Next. Once again, uppermost portion of the femur is removed, metal shell, Plastic liner, next. Stem inside the femur bone that has a metal neck with a ball placed on top of it. The ball can be of certain several bearing surfaces. One is cobalt chrome metal, ceramic, or a different type of metal which has been treated to act like a ceramic. This is the one I use. This is, happens to be from uh, the Smith & Nephew Company. It is a metal that has been treated so the outside surface is extremely smooth and shiny, just like the ceramic. It has very good wear characteristics, and it is supposed to lengthen the leg of the implant, although we do not have sufficient data to prove that yet. Next. So you've had the hip replacement, you go to recovery room, the recovery for a hip is very quick. You start therapy the day of surgery, you're discharged from the hospital in three to five days, and you follow up with your surgeon through the next year. You uh, undergo a rehab protocol, as Dr. Weiss mentioned, the, the knee repla replacement post-op protocols are much more difficult. It is really quite a bit easier. You do have to go to therapy, but nowhere near as long. And the main therapy for an, a hip replacement is really walking. Next. And just briefly, for uh, people who like to do crazy things, there is a different kind of hip replacement where the surface of the hip is replaced, but you do not cut away the ball and you don't uh, take away a lot of bone. This was invented in England, uh, named for Birmingham, England. There's a guy there named Derek McMinn who's put probably 8,000 of these things in people. And you see it's quite different. It's a metal cap that goes on the femur bone and a metal shell, and it's a metal-on-metal metal joint. What it does is not disturb the anatomy of your hip terribly, and it allows you to do more in the way of activity. I have, some, I have not done a lot of these. I've done six of them, and I have some people playing basketball and doing a lot of wild and crazy things, which I tell them not to do, but as the doctors here know, most people do it anyway. 
So just to compare, this conventional hip replacement, you see the ball and the neck are removed. And you see the stem and the ball and the plastic liner and the shell. So that's a total hip replacement. Next. This is the Birmingham hip replacement. It is a much harder operation to do. It is a much longer incision. But the people jump off the table. What happens is you shave the cartilage off the top of the femur bone. And then you tap this cap on top. And this metal shell, you shave out the cartilage here and you tap that in place. And then you reduce it. You see it's a very big ball and a very big cup. So it's very hard to dislocate the sit. And the thing that we worry about in hip replacement, although it's very much less common now, is dislocation. And these are very tough to dislocate. And these people just get off the table, they come walking in a week or two later, and they start doing crazy things. <laughs> so, the size of the head is important because it prevents dislocation. It has a very good metal, a smooth, shiny metal on both sides. And you can serve the bone such that, if this thing fails, you can put in a routine, normal total hip like we have talked about. So the people who need this are the young, active people, usually males, usually under 60, who do not want to have the limitations of a conventional total hip replacement. Other people can have it, but those are the people that usually get it. So we see, this is just basically, it's a resurfacing. As Dr. Weiss talked about, the knee replacement is really resurfacing. This is truly a resurfacing uh, of the hip joint. Large head. Reduced chance of dislocation. Hip replacements, 1 to 3 percent dislocate. Birmingham hips, 0 0.3 percent. Metal on metal. Keep going. No plastic liner to wear out. 97 percent reduction in wear. So there's the difference. You retain your original equipment. So if you have this for 20 years and it wears out, you can just go to the plain old hip replacement. Not hip replacement. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. side. Uh, we made a posterior incision probably 10-12 inches in length. Um, great procedure. Results have been uh, uh, super um, through the years, um, but there was disruption of the, the, uh, the muscles and the implant positioning um, is done by, by uh, feel more than anything else, uh, by trying to uh, locate landmarks and um, of 95% of the time the implants are in excellent position, 5% of the time the implants are not in acceptable position. Uh, positioning of the implants is the key in the longevity of the uh, uh, total hip. Now this is the, uh, the, this is the special table that we use for the anterior approach. The posterior approach is a very easy uh, procedure for us to perform, it's very quick. Uh, the anterior approach is a technically much more demanding procedure from, from our standpoint, but the results from the patients have been, uh, have been excellent. Uh, in, this, in this position, 
the patient lies on, on, on her back. The incision is made right in the front of the leg here. There's no detachment of muscles. We use a live x-ray machine so that while we're, we make the incision here, while we're putting the uh, acetabulum or the socket in place, I can actually watch the position under uh, x-ray guidance and, and I can pretty much uh, reasonably guarantee that I'm going to be in an acceptable position just about every case. The other thing that we do is um, we can measure leg length. So I have some of the complications, let me mention those, I don't know if those were mentioned in the previous talk. Uh, complications from any type of surgery, especially joints, would be infection. Um, we use big doses of antibiotics to help prevent against that. Uh, we can run into trouble with phlebitis or blood clots, and we normally will put the patients on anticoagulants. Uh, post-op to help prevent against that. Uh, with total hips, um, the biggest concern is dislocation of the hip. Um, the incidence of the, the posterior approach is uh, anywhere from 3 to 5 percent, depending on which study you look at. With the anterior approach, the uh, dislocation rate is less than a half of 1 percent. It's still a risk, but it's greatly reduced. Okay. One of the other things that we worry about is um, leg length inequality. Uh, after total hip, uh, I tell some of my patients, you know, we can make you a basketball player. I can lengthen that hip one or two inches. Um, and the patients are very unhappy with that. So uh, in the past, with the posterior approach, um, we, we use various means to determine the light lengths. They're not exact. And many times what happens is when you get the patient in the recovery room, you'll get the x-ray. Uh, and you'll see whether your implant is in correct position, and you'll measure leg lengths at that point. With this, with the live x-ray machine that we're using, the image intensifier, I can actually measure the leg lengths on the table, comparing both hips to the landmarks of the pelvis, and we have um, pretty much equal leg lengths 99% of the time. Next slide. Okay. Potential benefits for the anterior approach? Less trauma to the body. Smaller incisions, uh, potentially less pain, less tissue disruption, fewer restrictions during recovery. Um, Post-op, uh, the patients have been doing very well. Usually they've been on a walker for two to three days, then we go to a cane, um, usually off of everything by a week and a half to two weeks. Uh, patients can return to work, return to pretty much normal activities by three weeks. There are no post-operative uh, dislocation precautions uh, with the uh, posterior approach. Um, patients have to be careful of certain positions, um, sitting, uh, riding in a car initially to prevent dislocation. Uh, next slide. And in summary, uh, leading cause of hip arthritis uh, or, or hip pain is osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is degenerative and won't get better. Uh, early diagnosis and treatment uh, is important. Uh, the hip replacement does help to relieve pain and improve mobility. Um, and your surgeon will help choose the right surgery course for you uh, at consultation. Thank you. Uh, the question was, does a partial knee replacement last longer? Uh, and the answer is no. Uh, and, I mean, I'll get the panel's opinion, but typically, um, when they first came out, they were meant for older patients, less less lower demand patients. You know, say an 80, 80 year old woman uh, who's you know fairly low demand. As uh, they did very well, some surgeons start to push the envelope, start putting in people in their 40s and you know 50s. And in patients in their 40s and 50s, I'll, I'll tell them flat out, it's more of a time buying procedure until you get the total knee replacement. Yeah, um, in a patient that's very active, is out playing golf, doing pushing the knee, I think I, a partial knee replacement, they'll be lucky if they get seven years out of it. Uh, but let's we'll see what everybody else does. Yeah, my, my philosophy with partial knee replacements is that it doesn't correct the alignment. All it does is resurface a, a area. So the indications, I think, are very limited in terms of somebody who has isolated pathology in one part of the knee, meaning that if the bone died in that part of the knee or something of that nature. And that's really, I think, the exception rather than the rule. The other issue with the partial knee replacements that I found is that the results are, I think, much less predictable 
I think you probably, whereas you get a 95 to 98% success rate with a total knee, you probably get a 70 to 75% success rate, and it may be for a variety of factors with a partial. And the third factor is that it's a temporary procedure. So you're looking at having to revise that to a total knee at some point in time, whether it be 5, 10, 15 years. When you revise that to a total knee, it's not like just changing it to a primary knee. It, it's, a, it's a less successful primary knee replacement when you, when you change it from a partial to a total. So in my practice, I've significantly decreased the amount of partials that I do for those three reasons. I think they last about five to seven years. Yeah. I mean, partial years. What's the length for the total knee? Uh, in my experience, I have some that are out there 24 years, so, and I think they're supposed to go longer than that. I agree from that standpoint also. Uh, the partial replacement is a temporizing procedure. Uh, it does, as Carl mentioned, it does not correct the, uh, the alignment of the leg, and that it biomechanically is the most important thing in, in uh, the longevity of the, uh, uh, the implant. Uh, I have greatly reduced my uh, unicompartmental needs as well uh, based on that. Most patients don't want to hear that they're going to have to come back in five years and convert it to a total knee. And the, uh, as Carl mentioned also, the revision back from a uni to a total knee is a redo knee, it's a, a, a multiply operated knee, and the results are not as good. <laughs> With respect to uh, longevity of the knee replacement, can you comment on the difference uh, in uh, expected uh, life of the repair between the fixed bearing sigma knee and the uh, rotating platform sigma knee? Uh, I, I don't believe there's any difference between the two. Uh, they have been off the car. Well, Wayne can comment. He's the only one who's good at that. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it, there are. It depends. Uh, the literature there is literature that on the on the LCS knee, uh, which is a uh, mobile bearing knee. If you, you know, if you look at all of the scientific literature, there is literature that shows that that has the longest duration. But you know, you can find literature that'll support probably any of the prostheses that we presented today. Um, it's more conceptual. I, I just I like it for my younger patients. It makes more sense to me uh, from, an, from just a, an anatomic standpoint, uh, but I, you know, the literature it, it's, it's it varies. So you'll find articles that say that a, a uh, mobile bearing knee will last longer, but you'll find articles that will say a cruciate retaining knee. It's it's all over. It's, it's it's there's I can't give you a set answer and say I guarantee you that's gonna because you know most knees put in good alignment will last probably 20, 20 to 25 years. Right now it's very surgeon dependent. If you have a good technician, it's put in the right way, any of the above are gonna last a long time. And if you get a patient that you know is smart and doesn't abuse it, it'll, it'll last. I, I think one of the downsides of the mobile uh, bearing knee is that um, so I've seen some that have dislocated. Well, I don't know if you can see any weight, but never. No, I've, well, I've seen at least two the rotating platform, in other words, instead of staying in its groove, will sometimes flip out. And I've seen two of them in the past that had to be revised. So that's that's the only downside that I've seen from that. I'd probably put in 800. Yeah. I've never seen it. There's no medications for uh, restoring any of the cartridges between the femur and the... No, there, there is no medication. The, they, they always have this uh, combination of con chondroitin sulfate glucosamine. Yeah. The, the studies on, on the, that medication are equivocal in the literature. <laughs> I used it years ago and I recommended that patients try it, um, but there have been some large studies that show that it's the equivocal. There were some studies that showed pictures um, of before and after that the, uh, the cartilage actually regrew but I, I don't think there's anything in the literature that supports that. Doesn't sound logical. No. Uh, as a surgeon, why wouldn't you want to concentrate on one joint? <laughs> Honestly, I'd get bored. <laughs> <laughs> the more you do, the better you get at it. Uh, I, I think certainly the more you put in, the better you get. But we've all done a lot of joints. Um, 
there are guys that specifically focus on one joint, but um, I mean, personally, I, I'm just attracted I, I, to the knee and the shoulder. I do some hips. I, I like the variety. Um, I don't know, anyone else want to tackle that? I think everybody up here does all types of joint replacements, you know, when well, we're in practice. We were all trained in, uh, in taking care of the entire body, uh, and uh, it's, it's a variety, actually. Uh, I'll say, if I only did hips or knees uh, specifically, I'd probably get a little bored, as you mentioned, also. What's the downside of the hip resurfacing procedure? You presented mostly the positive things. What's the downside? Uh, Why would you not do it? Well, there are a couple reasons you can't do it. Uh, one is if you are uh, older than that 60, uh, your bone has to be very strong. Uh, I did mention that the surgery is much more aggressive. The incision is longer, it's more dissection, it's more blood loss. Um, and I think it's critical what you do with your, yourself. You know, if you're not going to do those things, a hip replacement is much less invasive way to get what you want. But if you want to be very vigorously athletic and not think about your hip and do whatever you want, then that resurfacing is, is for you. If there are big guys, you know, recommend it for bigger guys? It can be done, big guys, absolutely. And you didn't mention anything about the controversy about metal, metal joints versus oh other types. That's a big one. Do you have two hours? Yeah, that's a long one. Well, yeah. you know, if, if you're contemplating a replacement, that's a big decision. I think uh, at this point in time, uh, metal on metal is, has a little bit of trouble associated with it. And I think there are bearing surfaces that are just as good. So I think right at this moment in time, a metal on metal may not be a great idea. This Birmingham hip has a long track record, though, with none of the problems associated with the metal-on-metal -metal hip replacement. The issues with metal-on-metal -metal came about with one specific type of prosthesis, <clears throat> in which they tried to take the concept of metal-on-metal -metal and extend it by making, if a big head was good, a bigger head would be better. Well, in making a bigger head, they used a smaller cup, a lower profile cup, and because of that, ended up getting edge loading. And that had about two times the failure rate of the primary metal and metal hip. Thus, the lawyers have jumped all over that and see this as a way to make some money. Um, the failure rate is about 12%. The failure rate of a primary total hip is 5 to 6%. All comers, infection, dislocations, fractures, everything like that. So. Uh, but because of that, metal on metal, the interface has gotten a bad reputation. Okay? And it's almost more of a medical legal situation right now than it is a, uh, an actuality. Uh, there's been metal on metal hips that have been out there, you know, 10, 12, 15 years that have as good a track record, if not better, than the metal on plastic. And the advantage of the metal on metal is that you can use a bigger head gives you better range of motion, better stability, less dislocation, and less wear, less chance of having revision. The downside of the non-ASR hip, you know, the non-metal and metal that's been recalled, is that the, the wear products, instead of being plastic particles, are metal particles, and nobody knows 20, 30, 40 years down the road what those cobalt or chromium ions may do. Yes? I had one of my hips done in Florida, and afterwards in Florida they sent you to a rehab for 10 days to two weeks. Now I need my other hip done, and I found out you don't do rehab that long at all. Uh, the re you're talking Medicare situation? <laughs> uh, no, they, Med they Medicare for physical therapy, yeah. they keep you in the place. Medicare used to approve anyone who had a single primary joint going to a rehabilitation for seven to ten days. They still that, do that in Florida. I, that's why I was wondering if it's the doctors or if it's... No, it's it was, it's basically it's a Medicare rule. Now, the patient has to be evaluated, and if they're not doing poorly, they typically or don't have other co comorbidities such as cardiac, neurologic, you know, pulmonary problems. They don't qualify. So basically what they do what Medicare has done is that they've changed their regulations as to who qualifies for rehabilitation after. 
Well, they still do it there because I talked to a doctor and he says you go right from the hospital to the rehab for physical therapy. I was wondering if that is a maybe a different insurance. insurance. It's an insurance situation. Well, Absolutely. you still can do that here. We're talking about level one uh, rehab facilities. Medicare wouldn't allow a single joint to go to Good Shepherd, for example, or Moss Rehab, but you would qualify probably for a transitional care facility um, at 17th and Chu uh, that Lehigh Valley has, uh, Liberty. Uh, there, there are rehab facilities that are level twos that many patients will qualify but will be refused from the level ones. Like if you live alone, would Medicare approve something Absolutely. like that? Absolutely, yes. I can tell you that for sure because I have a lot of people like that that do go to the level twos, uh, but they won't go to Good Shepherd, won't go to a Moss Rehab, which are the level ones. And how long do they keep them? Usually they'll keep them uh, seven or ten days, two weeks. Yeah, Medicare will cover up to 21 days. 21 yeah. days. And that is physical therapy? It's right. a skilled nursing facility. Yeah. It's not defined as a yes, yes, rehab. It's not a rehab facility. Chief right. Rehab is nursing. defined as three hours of physical therapy a day. Right. But if you go to a skilled nursing facility such as a Moravian Village or Holy Family Manor or somewhere along those lines, you might not get three hours of therapy a day, but you'll, you'll still get rehab every day. Right, right. Um, yeah, um, you talked mostly about um, uh, joints being replaced due to arthritic conditions. What about traumatic injuries, specifically a shatter to a shin bone and a knee? and the knee replacement, how long it would last. Is there anybody actually that deals more in traumatic injuries up there than just, you know? Well, that's a good question, but essentially when someone has a traumatic injury, why do they have pain later on? And the answer is when you fracture into a joint surface and that surface heals kind of in a stepped off fashion, that basically leads to arthritis because those surfaces aren't smooth anymore and essentially it's, it's the same arthritic process. Um, so I think we all replace joints for people that, are, that have had trauma. Um, it, it really, sometimes you're dealing with a little more deformity than, than others, but it's still, it would be a straightforward joint replacement. Does anyone? So rarely, rarely do you do a primary total joint uh, in a trauma situation. A patient comes in and has a common multiple multiple pieces um, an approximal tibia fracture, shin bone, or a distal femur, you really need to get bone stock first. In other words, you put everything together with plates and screws, allow that to heal, um, knowing that, that uh, you prepare the bones for a future knee replacement. Uh, otherwise, you don't, it, to put a knee replacement in with shattered bones, you don't have any uh, area of fixation. Well, he's had his in about a year and it's loose. So what's do you have that surgery again? Another knee, one? Knee replacement? Total. Total. Total is loose. Did they do it right after a trauma? No, it was a year. They put external fixators and then they try to rebuild it back. Well, if, if it's loose again, causing pain. Very much so. Very much. Have you looked into whether there may be a low grade infection? They yes. tried infection and they did the they did bone scans and then they did where they drew the blood out. And right. The uh, isotopes and, mm -hmm. and yeah. And it was yeah. Loose. And if it's, if it's loose and it's painful, then it probably needs to be needs to be revised. You referred to. Um, the bone health of someone who is older as compared to someone younger. But you can have poor bone health as a younger person. When you're contemplating putting a joint into someone, does your preliminary x-rays give you a good enough idea of what their bone health is? Because I'm, I'm asking because I do you assess somehow that they have good enough bones to put the joint into? Well, normally on plain x-rays, uh, we can tell uh, the quality of the bone stock, and that's one of the things that we try to determine preoperatively, is whether the, uh, the bone stock will hold a total joint replacement. Um, we have patients who are very osteoporotic on x-ray, and we can tell that uh, by the fact that the cortex, which is the thick part of the bone, is very thin. Um, I've had several patients um, in which I, uh, sub we subsequently obtained um, DEXA scans to check on their osteoporosis. I just felt they were too weak to undergo a hip replacement. There were two patients with hip replacements. I did another one who was very osteoporotic but had a fracture, 
and uh, we had to use an extra long stem. So it's it's a big it's a big uh, deal. Yes, we do evaluate so you that. You usually can pretty much tell just by the X-rays. Just by the X-rays, most of the time. Yeah. You, you said this has a long history, the interior hip, uh, but how recently has it been here and how many have you done in this area? I've been doing it for six months and I've done about 30. And, what, and um, but you still are recommending that now? Yes. More, uh, more so? I have, uh, I'm, I'm doing solely anterior approaches. Now I trained with the anterior approach. When I was in training, that's all that we did. Um, so I have, and I was in practice for four years in Connecticut before I came down here, and that's all that I did there. And this is kind of just um, going back to uh, to my uh, original training. Um, technically, like I said, it's, a, it, it's more difficult. We have a special table that allows us to expose the femur uh, more easily. Um, it's uh, minimally invasive. Uh, we don't detach a lot of tendons or bones, and the patient has been broken. But I think the biggest and most important thing is that we can watch the position of the implants, as I mentioned, on, on x-ray while I'm implanting them. And then we can measure leg lengths with the x-ray, so we're, we're pretty much right on in both, both areas, every case. It was mentioned in the Morning Call article that you work at Sacred Heart. Do you work at any of the other? Oh, schools? no, I work at Coordinated Health. Uh, but the hospital that you use? Well, Coordinated Health, we have our own hospital, inpatient oh. hospital, as well as Sacred Heart. Uh, I'm on staff there, but I, I do very few cases there. Can you talk about hip revisions? Well, <laughs> hip revisions can. It depends on what the problem is. If um, it loosens, if you have had loosening in the stem. Right. If you've had loosening in the stem, if you have any loosening at all, one of the first things we want to rule out is low-grade infection. And that's what we talked about. You would, we'll do special, we'll do bone scans, we'll do uh, blood studies, uh, sometimes even a hip aspiration to make sure that there's no evidence of infection. If it's purely just a loose uh, prosthesis, uh, the revision obviously is a bigger job. You have to, it, it, it's a um, longer procedure. Um, sometimes in order to remove the stem, if part of it's well fixed, uh, we have to do an extended osteotomy where we'll make uh, cut the outer window of the bone, open it up to get the stem out, put a new stem in that's longer to bypass the area that the femoral component was in before. If the uh, socket is loose also, that has to be removed. So it's a much bigger procedure. Uh, Norm, the, the post-operative for the revision, pretty much the same as the original surgery? Uh, usually, it depends on what has to be done, the quality of the bone, and the quality of the fixation that you obtain at the time of surgery, okay? Sometimes the patient won't be allowed to bear weight uh, for a period of time until the bone grows in. Um, because it's a longer and bigger procedure, uh, the rehab uh, is a little longer and a little tougher. But, but the life of the revision is typically similar or the same as I Again, it depends on, uh, the, it depends on the, the, the bone quality that's left, uh, but for the most part, the, the results from uh, uh, hip revisions are very good. It's not the 95% uh, good result from a primary hip, okay? It's probably about 80% in that neighborhood. Uh, but the results are good. If you have a painful hip um, and you can't walk on it and have it revived, you're going to be very pleased. Why is there a greater chance of dislocation early on in a hip replacement? I, I got that impression when you said it though. The reason for that is, uh, and again, I did the posterior approach for, for many years, um, is that when we do the posterior approach, you have to detach the, the posterior capsule and you have to detach the rotators, the muscles that attach to the back of the hip. Um, when we put the hip in, we'll repair the capsule back, and most of the time the hip is nice and stable. Uh, you know, if you get your components in proper alignment, the hip is stable. But you have to allow the soft tissues to heal around the hip to prevent their dislocation. That usually takes six to 12 weeks, okay? And the thing that'll happen is if you bring your leg with a posterior approach, bring your leg up and turn it in, you can pop it out the back because that's where you've, um, where you've done the work and you're waiting for the capsule to heal and a new capsule to form in that area. That takes about six to 12 weeks. So that's where the dislocation um, is, is uh, the highest. Down the road, once the three-month mark hits, that drops way down. 
12 years ago, <clears throat> I had a major back surgery. I am fused from S1 to T12. It's a solid fusion. Now I'm supposed to have a hip replacement, total hip replacement. Will that hurt when it comes to the, the rehabilitation? Because I, am, I don't have much motion. Well, uh, again, that's a good question. What you need to know, first of all, is any, any hip surgery is not going to help if you still have back pain from your previous surgery. Oh, surgery. I know that. Okay. Um, I think that if the hip is put in uh, appropriately and you're mobilized very quickly and you get up and you get moving and do the rehab, I mean, I don't think it will flare up your back if that's what you're asking. Um, again, like Dr. Scarpino pointed out, leg lengths are especially important in someone that's had some prior back problems. So your surgeon needs to be very careful with your leg lengths if they are not if they're off by a significant amount, that can flare your back up. So it's important, I think, to get those leg lengths perfect in someone like you. What I was more concerned with, I cannot do a lot of movements. Uh, the movements maybe that you would need for rehab to get your hip, you know, working well. If I couldn't do all those certain positions, would they be able? Would I be able to get back to, to a normal walking position? I'd have to kind of watch you walk and everything, but I, I, I don't see any reason. Sometimes the therapist will have to be careful that they don't flare your back up, but the, the rehab for the hips really is, is nothing like the knees. A lot of patients are going with rehab for the hip in three, four weeks. Um, so the rehab is a much smaller component for the hip, to be honest with you. A lot of times you put the hip in, if you put it in well, you'll have more motion within a week than you've had for the last 20 years. But the rehab is not, in my opinion, it's, it's nowhere near as important. The, the knee the rehab, the rehab, the knee's much more difficult yeah, the than the back. Knee, the knee rehab is a lot more, a lot more difficult, and it's it can definitely. <laughs> the, the hip rehab, I mean, they can modify your your strengthening uh, procedures if, if they bother your back. The big thing you want to do is get up. Well, you're going to have immediate motion, so you're not going to have to worry about obtaining that and and walking. And you know, you can sometimes eliminate uh, a lot of the strengthening things if they affect your back. The hip's a whole different animal from the from the knee. Going through the bus on the Zimmer knee, the plastic piece that's in there for the other rotation parts to go in. The gentleman on the bus mentioned that that wears, and you can just replace that. How common is that, and what does that do for the life of the knee? Uh, that's kind of a complex question, but. Um what you need to know again, out of the three components, the plastic is the weak link. And when that plastic wears, okay, if, it, if it's more, if it wears for an extended time, those plastic wear particles, which are microscopic, are taken up by surrounding uh, what we call macrophages, certain inflammatory cells in your body. And those macrophages cause an inflammatory cascade, which releases certain proteins or enzymes, which can actually lead to some lysis of the surrounding bone. So in a knee replacement especially, most of the time uh, you really can't get away with just replacing that plastic piece because it takes a long time for the plastic to wear and by that time you do get a lot, a lot of lysis of the bone and chances are one of the components is going to be loose. So. I, I kind of disagree that it's pretty rare that you do lose. So the problem with, with the, the, the plastic wearing down, uh, either on a fixed or a mobile, is you can't see it on x ray. You can't tell that it's wearing down, at least I haven't been able to. And by the time, like, like, uh, like uh, Wayne said, uh, the particles have eroded the bone and you're starting to see bone changes. And once you see bone changes around the prosthesis, that means the, um, the particles uh, act like a tumor and actually erode the bone around the prosthesis. So by that time, you have to take the, uh, the, whole, the whole knee out. Yeah. The one thing that's changed, though, about 12 years ago, they've improved the polyethylene. So any of you who've had replacements prior to 12 years had the older polyethylene. What they figured out is that by radiating it, they can strengthen those cross links. And whereas that polyethylene used to wear one millimeter a year, so if you had a 10 millimeter spacer in there, you looked at 10, 12 years, 
Now, it wears one-tenth of that. So theoretically, a 10 millimeter spacer should last 100 years. So the newer materials, the newer knees, are significantly better with less wear rates than 12, 15 years ago, than anybody who had a replacement then. So wear has become much less of an issue. When you're overweight like me, can you still do that? Uh, depends, on, uh, depends on your abdomen. Um, the grossly obese patients who have a BMI of probably over 40 or 45 or tougher to do, uh, it would depend on whether the patient uh, has a large panis. Okay, in other words, a lot of patients will, will be overweight, but they but everything's right here. Some patients have a large panis that will fall over their hip, and those are the ones that are very difficult because you can't. There's no way to hold that up while you're doing the procedure, and you can develop wound problems. So the grossly obese patients um, are the ones that we would have wouldn't be able to do it in that position. So to tell, I would have to make an appointment? Probably have to come in, and what I do is I, I have the patients lie down on the table, and I'll, I'll actually look at, the, look at the, uh, the leg and make sure that we can mobilize uh, the abdomen. If not, we, I roll them up on their side and check and, and see how that looks, and we'll make a decision whether we put posterior or anterior. Thank you. This lady here. Um, I've been uh, diagnosed having uh, stage one vascular necrosis of the hip, and I've heard about uh, core decompression. What do you feel about that? Is that you know, procedure to is it putting um, a band-aid on something or if you have stage one uh, and the top of your femur bone is still round, uh, there's a reasonably good chance that if you had that you'd be able to preserve that for a while. I think it's probably a good idea. If there's any flattening of I don't know if there is or not. Yeah, there'll be, I don't know if MRI is good, it tells you the involvement of how much of the head is involved with this condition. But a plain x ray, it shows flattening. Not <coughs> it does not, I think, mark. Would that be, instead of a bone, it would be a replacement? Would you consider that to be a Do that diet? first and see if you can preserve your native hip for as long as you can keep it. If that fails, then I think it's a replacement. And what, you know, what does that involve as far as you know, procedure and the recovery period and things like that? Yes. The core decompression was, uh, is basically drilling a drill up into the area of the bone that is yes. dead. Uh, it does require some restricted weight bearing because of the hole you make on the outside of the bone to get in there. So generally you're on crutches or a walker for three to four weeks. But it's not a horrible operation, it's not a big decision. Uh, so I think that you're probably a good candidate if you do not have flattening of that. I have a little bit of a problem here with the, I think the, some of the cartilage uh, is degenerated, gone. I had a skiing accident about a few years ago and it was finally caught up with me. And uh, which of the two partial and the, and the, the pin uh, replacement would be recommended? It's very hard to say. I think the first thing is you need an x-ray. I think from your story, it's likely that your knee is subluxing a little bit, and your arthritis is probably a little worse than, than you want it to be, and I think you probably would need it totally replacement. Doctor, when would you delete the uh, decompression in your practice? I do. Okay. Thank you very much. I'll be